Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Dave Allen. I'm one of the building control directors at Cook Brown Building Control. I hope you're all doing well. Um, it's fantastic to see 40 odd people in the meeting. Um, I did hold uh, a similar event a couple of weeks ago and we had 40 or 50 people at that. So uh, there's some real interest in the content. So I hope you enjoyed today. Um, I'm just going to open up my screen now and share my slides with you. So bear with me for a second. OK, lovely. Right. Um, so this afternoon you're joining me for approximately 45 minutes so I can take you through the proposed changes to construction legislation and the building control system. And that's mainly associated with fire safety following the Grenfell fire. That's uh, me. Now just some housekeeping before I start. This is a listen only webinar. And we will be recording and sharing this with you so you can share in turn uh, with your own colleagues. So please, if you wouldn't mind keeping your videos off and keep microphones on mute. If you do have any questions, please type these into the um, panel. I think it will probably be at the top of your screen. Um, and then um, I'd be happy to answer some of those, uh, if not uh, all those questions at the end of the webinar. If you do have any difficulties, I recommend you log out and come back in, into the meeting. So what are we going to cover in the next 45 minutes? After a brief introduction to Cook Brown and the Hickton Group, I'll give you a summary of the far-reaching draft building safety bill. I'll look at how raising competency levels is going to affect all of us in this room. And also how the building control industry is reacting to the building and safety bill. I'll then take a short interlude to look at changes to approved documents M and B. And I'll give you an insight into where the government are heading with fire safety with the recent fire safety consultation. And then finish with questions and answers around about 2.45. It's quite a bit to get through and I uh, hope you enjoy it. So who are the Hickton Group? Well, we're a multidisciplinary provider of quality inspections or more commonly known as Clark of Works and consultancy services to the construction sector. Our ethos is to champion quality, compliance and sustainability. We currently have 4,000 projects worked on by 200 staff in 11 office locations. The group is made up of separate companies. That's Cook Brown Building Control, Cook Brown Energy, Hickson Quality Control, and a further building control body known as BRCS. Cook Brown Approved Inspectors was founded by James Cook and Matt Brown late in 2013 and started trading in January 2014. Jim and Matt wanted to provide an approved inspector business with customer service at the core of our role to help ensure compliance with building regulations. So initially predominant in the Avon area, the service soon springboarded into the Midlands and beyond with offices in Bristol, Taunton, Tewkesbury, Birmingham, London and Leeds. Cook Brown provides building control services on both domestic and commercial schemes and, and I and my colleague Dave Kirby work closely together to provide expert advice on complex and large projects across the country. Cook Brown joined the Hickton, Hickton Group in 2020. Hickton Quality Control was established in 1991 and for 29 years have provided highly respected clerk of work services over a vast range of projects, types, uh, project types, clients and sectors. This is provided by a countrywide network of 100 experienced building, M&E, civil and landscaping quality site inspectors. And that team is headed up, headed up by our operations manager, John King. Cook Brown Energy is headed up by Matt Hodges and is our independent energy assessment company providing compliance solutions for commercial and residential projects throughout England and Wales. Matt's team can provide SAP and SBEM calculations, commercial EPCs, dynamic simulation model modelling or DSM and condensation risk analysis. And lastly, BRCS began life as an approved inspector in 1996 as a pioneer in the delivery of private building control. And a small team at BRCS have achieved a reputation for expertise on large projects and frameworks, including Whitbread, Domino's, O2 and Costa Coffee. BRCS are headed up by Andrew Bullen.
And let's look at the draft building safety bill together. Government has responded to Judith Hackett's report, Building a Safer Future, and the outcomes of the Grenfell Tower inquiry through a new building safety regime underpinned by legislation and guidance. This has culminated with the publication of the far-reaching draft building safety bill, which came out in July 2020. The bill was published in draft form to enable pre-legislative scrutiny. This scrutiny will be taken forward by the HCLG Select Committee, which launched its call for written evidence, and that closed on the 14th of September. That committee will also hold oral evidence sessions with key stakeholders before publishing their report and recommendations. The extent of any recommended changes will dictate when the bill will be ready to be introduced. The aim is to be ready as soon as possible in 2021. And if things proceed as planned, we can expect the bill to achieve royal assent by the end of 2021 at the latest. There are five main parts to the bill. Part one is the overview. Part two is the regulator and its functions. Part three, changes to the Building Act 1984. Part four, higher risk buildings. And part five, supplementary in general. So the regulator and its functions, part two. This establishes a new building safety regulator within the health and safety executive and defines the scope of the regime with respect to the definition of risks and creates a power set out in secondary legislation the buildings are included in that scope. The building safety regulator has three broad, uh, broad functions. One, implementing a new regime for higher risk buildings and acting as the building control authority overseeing and enforcing the new regime in occupation. Two, overseeing the performance of building control bodies, that's local authorities and registered building control approvers, currently known as approved inspectors, and advising on existing and emerging building standards and safety risks. And three, assisting and encouraging competence amongst uh, the building, or sorry, the built environment industry. This section also provides two key statutory definitions for building safety risk and higher risk buildings. So what is a higher risk building? Well, these cover all multi-occupied residential buildings of 18 metres or more in height or more than six storeys. And building safety risk is defined as a risk to the safety of persons arising from the occurrence of a fire or structural failure or other prescribed matter. Part three, the Building Act 1984. The Draft Fire Safety Bill amends the Building Act 1984 for England to set out the new regulatory regime during the design and construction phase for buildings in scope and puts in place requirements for registration of building inspectors and building control approvers to improve competence levels in the building control sector. This part of the bill includes amendments to the Building Act to one, allow the building safety regulator to act as the building control authority for higher risk buildings. And two, provide powers for building regulations to set out the detailed regime for higher risk buildings. As you recall, that's buildings of over 18 metres or more uh, in the residential class. Building regulations will be used to establish the gateways process for the design, construction and refurbishment of buildings in scope and establish the regime for duty holders. Some of you may recall what the gateways are, but let's go over those um, shortly. So those are gateway one, that's a fire statement submitted as part of a planning application covering fire brigade access and water supply. So it's similar to the submission of a design and access statement at planning stage. Gateway two, which is prior to construction and is a hard stop, and that is where construction cannot start until the building safety regulator is satisfied that the regulations for a particular scheme are met. And gateway three is the completion, completion phase golden thread of information to be handed over to the building safety regulator by the accountable person and duty holder. So if you're a developer and you're um, working on um, 150, 200 flats, um, this will really slow down the handover of those flats because the building safety regulator will be pouring over all the certification um, and not issuing um, uh, the gateway free sign off until uh, they're satisfied of all that information meeting compliance. So the other recommendations within part three 
are putting in place requirements for the registration of building inspectors and building control approvers and powers for the Secretary of State advised by the building safety regulator to act where a local authority is exercising its building control functions below the expected standard. So let's look at part four of the building safety bill, higher risk buildings. So this sets out requirements for higher risk buildings when they are occupied, including duties on the accountable person or the duty holder in occupation, and building safety managers in relation to safety risks in their building. This part includes provisions relating to the management of buildings in occupation, including defining the accountable person, and that is a person in possession of or with a repairing obligation of the common parts of the building and the building safety manager. And that is a person responsible for managing in, in accordance with a safety case and coordinating and reporting. There are provisions for putting in place requirements for registering a building and applying for a building assurance certificate. A building assurance certificate is issued by the building safety regulator once he or she are satisfied that accountable, the accountable person complies with statutory obligations placed on them. There are provisions for setting requirements for the ongoing management of safety and information to be held as part of the golden thread of safety information. There's provision for setting requirements for the ongoing engagement with residents and for the obligations on residents in relation to the safe management of buildings, which is interesting. Um, as you may be aware, uh, there were flats um, within Grenfell where fire doors or fire door closes were taken off and holes punched through doors, etc. So there is an obligation on those that live in flats as well. Um, there's also provisions for measures around the recovery of costs and special measures where an accountable person is not able to fulfil their duties and enforcement of the regime. Part five of the bill, supplementary in general. This includes provisions requiring developers to belong to a new homes ombudsman scheme and powers to regulate construction products through statutory instruments. It proposes the remo removal of the democratic filter, which requires social housing residents to refer unresolved complaints to a designated person or wait eight weeks before they can um, access redress via the housing ombudsman. There's also powers for the Secretary of State to create a statutory list of safety critical construction products and require construction products that are not covered by the existing regime or included on the statutory li list to be safe products. There are provisions giving powers to the Architects Registration Board or ARB to monitor the competence of architects after registration and allow disciplinary orders, orders to be listed alongside an architect's entry on the register. The Building Safety um, Bill also um, talks about competence. We'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a second. But in the bill, the bill creates powers to prescribe in building regulations competence requirements on the principal designer and principal contractor and any prescribed person and to impose duties on the persons appointing them to ensure they meet competence requirements. This is to ensure everyone doing design or building work is competent to carry out that work in line with building regulations. Statutory guidance in the form of an approved document will be provided to support these requirements. The accountable person will be under a statutory duty to appoint either a competent corporate body or competent manager from within their own organisation to act as a building safety manager or BSM. The regulator has the power to veto that appointment and can direct the accountable person to remove their building safety manager if it transpires that they are not carrying out the functions to an acceptable standard. The regulator will have the power to issue guidance on how to assess the competence of building safety managers. Moving away from the draft building safety bill, I'll now look closer at competency. So what is competency? The task level description skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours required to undertake a defined task effectively. Ongoing assurance of competency is likely to become a matter of importance to us all. Not just for regulatory purposes, but also for insurance premiums and financial matters such as the releasing of stage payments. 
In the immediate aftermath of the Grenfell tragedy, an industry response group, or IRG, was set up by MHCLG and other leading umbrella bodies in the built environment. The steering group on competence for building a safer future, known as the Competence Steering Group, was established at the request of the IRG to take forward recommendations set out in the Building a Safer Future report by Dame Hackett. Twelve working groups were established covering industry processes and professions. And some of the working groups have drawn up their own uh, sector-specific competence frameworks with the intention that it will be rolled out across professions or trades without reference to a particular building type. And I will um, look at each of those in turn. Some of you may have seen this report, Setting the Bar. Setting the Bar is the second and final report of the Competence Steering Group and is an update of the interim report, Raising the Bar, published in August 2019. One key development has been the progression of an overarching competence framework standard setting out principles and core competence requirements for safety critical professions and trades on higher risk buildings. So these have been engineers, installers, fire engineers, fire risk assessors, fire safety officers, building standards professionals such as myself, building designers and architects, building safety managers, site supervisors, project managers and procurement professionals. The competence standards have three aspects. First, an overarching competence framework developed as a suite of national standards by an overarching competence committee that will be common to all disciplines. Secondly, discipline specific competence framework requirements which have been developed by the working groups, the 12 working groups, and thirdly, the oversight of assessment. I want to read to you an important statement by Graham Watts, the chair of the CSG, and this is contained in the Set in the Bar report. Most of what is in this report requires action by industry across the sectors represented in these discussions, fire safety, construction, the built environment, building owners and managers. And it's essential that every organisation gets cracking to arrange the enhanced competencies that are required. The building safety legislation will take time to be enacted and implemented, as will the suite of national standards, which will also need to be developed through due process. The industry, in its widest context, cannot stand still and wait for these things to happen. It must continue the momentum towards implementing change without delay. Now, those words echo Dame Hackett's uh, words in her report. Um, and I'm sure you're all finding through your own professional institutes uh, and professions that uh, movement is taking place in this area of competence. So what are the key recommendations of setting the bar report? Representatives of the UCAS and the Engineering Council work together to compare their respective methods for overseeing the assessment of competence and to identify the assessment and oversight arrangements that already exist for bodies carrying out assessment of competence for those professions and trades involved with higher risk buildings. All individuals who work on higher risk buildings are likely to materially affect or, or are likely to materially affect building safety outcomes should meet the competence requirements developed by the working groups. Compliance needs to be demonstrated by independent third party assessment and periodic reassessment. All others working on high risk buildings should be supervised by individuals who have been third party assessed as competent. Organisations themselves will need to set out clearly how the competence of the individuals carrying out the work is assessed and how they are managed and supervised. Existing arrangements for assessing and reassessing competence should be improved. A further recommendation is that persons working on higher risk buildings to be registered or certified by a recognised professional stroke certifica certification body. All organisations carrying out the assessment and reassessment of competence should themselves be subject to a rigorous system of oversight for activities in relation to higher risk buildings i.e. accrediting the accreditors. And this should be undertaken by a body such as UCAS or the Engineering Council at least every five years. A Building Safety Competence Committee should be appointed or designated by the Building Safety Regulator. The three regulated roles that have primary responsibility for building and life safety at each stage of a building's life cycle are the principal designer, 
principal contractor and the building safety manager. And they require competencies in addition to any discipline related competencies. The competencies of these regulated roles should be developed and maintained as national standards. The building safety regulator should hold and maintain a register of those qualified to perform the three regulated roles. And fire safety CPD materials explaining basic fire science, science would be benefit, beneficial across the industry and for those managing occupied higher risk buildings. So I just want to um, give you a flavour of what the 12 working groups are coming through with and it's contained within this report. So if you're an engineer, there's a recommendation that duty holders should appoint a lead engineer, engineer with responsibility for overall safety systems, integration and risk management. And the engineering register should incorporate standards requiring assessment and revalidation. What if you're an installer? Well, the industry should adopt a framework for all the installer sectors working on high risk buildings. The framework will consist of accredited third party certification of companies, level two or three qualifications for individuals, a card scheme such as, but not limited to the CSCS card, and an industry-wide CPD refresher training program should be introduced within each installer sector, specifying the training process and accessible storage of records. Contractors and building safety managers should ensure industry agreed fire safety resources are presented to all installers at induction. What if you're a fire engineer? Well, Working Group 3 recommends that professional engineers that is individuals who are members of a professional engineering institution licensed by the engineering council should be recognized as a means of providing assurance of relevant, comp relevant competence. Principal designer, principal contractor and building safety manager roles to appoint only professionally registered fire engineers and that fire safety strategy be a part of design. We do see many, many more fire strategies um, attached to the more complex buildings these days. What about fire risk assessors? Working Group 4 recommends that accredited third party certification of fire risk assessors and organisations should be introduced with registers of people's accredited and that there is a statutory duty to use only accredited fire risk assessors. Fire safety officers under Working Group 5. The recommendation is that government should consider the broader issues associated with recruitment and retention of fire safety officers and support fire and rescue services in addressing these. Provide additional funding due to the increased financial burdens to fire and rescue services as a result of enhanced competence standards. As a recommendation that consideration needs to be given to how the competence of fire safety officers in the devolved administrations is maintained. So that would be the Crown Premises Fire Safety Inspectorate and Defence Fire Safety Regulators. In my own profession, building control, under working group six. The recommendations are that the period between peer review of competence for building standards professionals should be at least once every five years. And the building safety regulator should be the body responsible for controlling and maintaining the systems of competence. And for those uh, in the call uh, who are building designers or architects, again, there should be a competence framework to, framework to cover these professions. But the competence of building designers and architects working on higher risk buildings is reassessed every five years. Working group eight covered building safety managers, and this is to be a role with statutory duties and functions responsible for life safety in whole buildings and for engagement with residents and occupiers. And to ideally sit within a wider organisational structure that will need to comply with legal requirements for organisational capability. And the building safety manager will be appointed by the accountable person who is the duty holder. And again, a competency framework for the named individual building safety managers. So what would a building safety manager necessarily look like? To be competent, a person must demonstrate adequate and appropriate minimum relevant experience in managing building risk and demonstrate a relevant recognised professional qualification. Demonstrate requirements of the competence framework are met through assessment of their skills, knowledge, experience and behaviour. And resubmission for certification of named individual building safety managers competence should occur every three years, evidencing participation in a refresher course, relevant CPD and adherence to the code of conduct. 
Working group nine, site supervisors. There's a need for three distinct roles to ensure the on-site delivery of a safe building. One is the construction project manager, or CPM, whose primary role is to liaise with the client and design team, procure the appropriate subcontractors, materials, plant and equipment required of the project and oversee all the construction work. The second person is the site supervisor, or SS, who oversees the on-site construction works to ensure the works are completed safely to specification and to the required standard. And thirdly, a new role, the independent construction assessor or ICA. So this person's working on behalf of the client and is involved in the design phase, defining the test and inspection regime required, and then assures the on and off site works comply with the design and all necessary building standards and regulations. What if you're a project manager? Working group 10 recommends uh, adoption of a project management competence framework. So there's a common theme here. Um, and that comprehensive be the level of competence that is required of project managers. And project managers must be members of a recognized professional body. Working group 11, procurement professionals. The procurement lead will be assessed and accredited against a new procurement competence framework and a designated individual will be assigned as the procurement lead. What other recommendations are there? Well, there should be a statutory certification and registration structure for higher risk buildings covering a building register, the registration and certification for the building safety manager organization and named individuals, and registration for the accountable person and duty holder. There's a further recommendation to maintain the golden thread of information throughout a building's life cycle. The fire and emergency file should become mandatory and in a mandated format on a central national database. An occupier education engagement should be supported by an extended fire kills campaign. And there should be a strengthened right of reasonable and proportionate access to information for individual residential units for owner occupiers, including fire risk assessments. There's quite a lot to take on board there, um, but it's, it, it's a document that is well worth uh, reading uh, to give you that roadmap of where your own profession is heading in terms of competency. BSI have been very active as well. So MHCRG have commissioned the uh, British Standards Institution to take forward a programme to deliver a suite of national standards under the direction of a newly established built environment competent standards strategy group. That's made of government, industry and consumer interest groups. These national standards include an overarching competence framework, as discussed earlier, which are free publicly available specifications or PAS or PAS documents. And that will form the basis of the competence requirements for three new regulated roles. Again, the principal designer, the principal contractor and the building safety manager. It's worth having a look at the BSI publication, Flex 8670 Built Environment, overarching framework for competence of individuals specification. As this lays the base for a set of British standards for competence. And if you recall, it's worth me reinforcing that the government intend to issue an approved document for construction competence, thus setting this as a requirement of the building regulations. To give you an overview of how the building control industry is reacting, I just wanted to quickly look at the future of building control group publication, recommendations on the future regulation of the building control sector and profession in England. Leadership organisations from across the building control sector, comprising of the Associ Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors, RICS, Chartered Association of Building Engineers, and the Construction Industry Council, Local Authority Building Control, and NHBC, have come together to develop 11 key recommendations for the future oversight and regulation of the profession. The 11 recommendations are a starting point for further dialogue with government and the building safety regulator as to how best to protect the public interest by making sure the sector further improves competence amongst professionals and organisations. So some of the key recommenda recommendations including clarity on the actual role of building control bodies, steps to simplify and unify building control legislation, processes and pro procedures. So if you 
use local authority, you may find it slightly different from the private sector, how that operates. Uh, another recommendation is an independent designated body to oversee professional registration and organisational audit. The introduction of a new competence framework to cover all persons working in building control, including those working on higher risk buildings in scope with a new regulator. A unified pan industry code of conduct for all building control bodies and professionals and a unified pan industry career structure to set clear expectations of competence across the building control sector. And finally, the transfer of building control process from primary legislation to secondary as part of the building safety bill work stream. I'll now take you through um, the changes to approved document B. The document shown on the screen sets out amendments to guidance previously published in approved document B, fire safety volume one dwellings and volume two buildings other than dwellings 2019 edition. The changes highlighted in this amendment booklet take effect next Thursday, so that's 26th of November 2020, for use in England. The 2019 edition will continue to apply where a building notice or an initial notice has been given to or a full plans deposited with a council before the 26th of November 2020. And even the building work to which it relates has started before the 26th of November or it starts before the 29th of January 2021. So it's quite a short period. So the changes focus on fire safety provision in blocks of flats. Only two items. Item A, sprinklers. So we now have a reduction in the trigger height from 30 metres to 11 metres. Um, some of you will be aware that sprinklers should be provided within the individual flats and they, they don't necessarily need to be provided in the common areas such as stairs, corridors or landings uh, when these areas are, are fire sterile. And what's the second change? Well, the second change is concerning wayfinding signage for the fire service. And this is a new recommendation for floor and flat indication signage within blocks of flats with stories over 11 metres. And this is to assist the fire service to identify each floor and flat. And these, these signs should be located on every landing of a protected stairway and every protected corridor or lobby or open access balcony into which a firefighting lift opens. And to give you a taste of the detail, the text should be in sans serif typeface with a letter height of at least 50 millimetres the height of the numeral that designates a floor number should be at least 75 millimetres. And these signs should be mounted between 1.7 and 2 metres above floor level. So when I come checking your buildings, uh, I'll be <laughs> bringing my tape and uh, checking all of those. All floor identification signs should be supplemented by flat number indicator signs, which provide information relating to the flats accessed on each storey. So if you've been following the Grenfell inquiry, most of what I've been talking about today is coming directly out of Hackett and the inquiry. And we're still in um, uh, stage two inquiries, so there will be more to come. Um, so in, in the terms of um, how this ties back, way, wayfinding signage ties back to Grenfell, the firefighters had problems in uh, clearly de uh, defining which floor they were actually on. Right, let's now look at an important home office consultation. In conjunction with the release of the draft building safety bill, there have been, uh, there's been a home office consultation on the regulatory reform fire safety order 2005. And this is uh, the, the aim of this consultation is to remove identified weaknesses in the current legislation and to move that, uh, to, to align more closely with the requirements of the draft building safety bill and the fire safety bill and include recommendations made by the Grand Tower, uh, Grenfell Tower Phase 1 inquiry. So this consultation is split into three sections. One was strengthening the regulatory reform fire safety order 2005. Two is implementing the phase one recommendations of the Grenfell inquiry. And three, improving the consultation process between building control bodies and fire authorities. Let's just have a look at section one, strengthening the fire safety order and improving compliance. The call for evidence was for better supporting guidance. So there's a plan to overhaul the current suite of guidance. There's an issue with the identification of the responsible person. And that is a, seen as a significant challenge. 
So expect to see a legal requirement on the responsible person to record who they are, the extent of their responsibility for the building under the fire safety order, their contact information, all as part of the fire risk assessment. The variable quality of fire risk assessments is a significant concern, and government are consulting on a proposal to introduce a competence requirement for fire risk assessors, as I've touched upon earlier. Multi-occupied residential buildings to provide fire specific fire safety information to residents. This would include providing the fire risk assessments to residents upon request. The consultation talks about additional clarity and support for enforcing authorities to act against non-compliance with the fire safety order and was seeking views on the sufficiency of the level of fines. The government are testing views on the effectiveness of maintenance of facilities, equipment and devices for safeguarding relevant persons and firefighters in the event of a fire and better defining higher risk workplaces. There's also fire rescue authorities to charge for enforcement activity under the fire safety order, including the charging for false fire alarms. Section two of the consultation is the implementation of the Grenfell Tower inquiry phase one report recommendations. So government are looking to set a clear height threshold for this category of buildings referred to as high rise. And this is aligned to the proposed scope of the Building Safety Bill on enactment, which, as I said, is 18 metres and or more than six storeys, whichever comes first. There's an interesting um, piece about responsible persons to provide local fire service with information about the design of the building's external walls and details of the materials they're constructed from. Responsible persons will need to inform the fire service of any material changes made. Responsible persons also providing information relating to the level of risk arising from the design and materials of the external wall structure and the associated mitigating steps that have been taken. So that's quite a, a big step um, for a responsible person to take uh, um, control of. Responsible persons to provide their local fire service with an up-to-date uh, set of electronic floor plans. Some of you may well have um, come across premises information boxes in all um, in, in buildings and there's a proposal to put these in all high rise uh, multi-occupied residential premises and these will contain uh, hard copies of plans and risk assessments. There's a recommendation for the exception reporting of failures of relevant lifts and other critical firefighting equipment and monthly checks. And where failures are found they must report to local fire service including transparency to residents. I recall watching the uh, inquiry uh, phase one and um, or um, reading that uh, the lifts didn't work properly in, in the building. Um, so this has come directly from that. Um, there's recommendations for responsible persons to provide details of any residents who self-identify to them as requiring assistance to evacuate to their local fire service and to place this information in a premises information box. Responsible persons to undertake checks of the self-closing devices in multi-occupied residential buildings over 11 metres and above. So if the building is over 18 metres, the recommendation is all fire doors in the common parts should be checked at not, least, uh, not less than three monthly intervals and all flat entrance fire doors at not less than six monthly intervals. And that's a massive undertaking. If the building is between 11 and 18 metres, the recommendation is all fire doors in the common part should be checked at not less than six monthly intervals and all flat entrance fire doors at not less than yearly intervals. There's even a recommendation for buildings under 11 metres and they're promoting the checks of self-closing devices on all fire doors in these buildings at a frequency which would take account of the age of the building, its height and risk profile. And finally, requirements for wayfinding signage in all multi-occupied residential buildings, 11 metres and above, which has come through the new building regulation. Part three of this consultation document is about building control bodies and their consultation with fire and rescue authorities. I think most of you have probably heard of a plan certificate, which is a statement that the approved inspector where they are the building control body has checked the plans of the building work and considers them to be compliant with the building regulations. 
as a recommendation in this consultation that plan certificates become mandatory for buildings covered by the regulatory reform order. Um, as a recommendation to promote timely engagement between the building control body and the fire risk assessment. I'm certainly a great fan of talking to the fire brigade as early as possible um, to iron out any, um, any risk. The document talks about a statutory time frame for responses by the fire risk assessment, uh, fire risk, uh, fire authority rather, to provide further clarity about what is required and when, and if so, what it should be. It's important that the fire authority responses are timely to ensure their views are taken into consideration in time. The government are seeking views on whether there are problems with resolving disputes between building control bodies and fire rescue authorities, which could benefit from a mediation panel. And if so, which representative body should be involved? I'm, on, I'm involved with um, a pan building control London Fire Brigade consultation group, and um, it's a very, very good group. And I don't, I don't see many, many issues um, between building control bodies and fire rescue authorities um, that can't be resolved um, in a, a straightforward way. Um, the government talk about the principle of being able to refer to standing advice produced at the national level for use at the local level, rather than having to develop specific advice on each occasion. And finally, uh, many of you would have come across Regulation 38. So the government are looking to improve the effectiveness of the current arrangements for Regulation 38 that requires fire safety information to be provided to the responsible person for premises subject to the fire safety order. The government consulting on whether the scope of the application of Regulation 38 should be extended to material alterations, i.e. conversion works. So what other consultations and documents have been issued? Well, we have um, BS 9251, Fire Sprinkler Systems for Domestic and Residential Occupancies Code of Conduct, and that consultation uh, ended on the 27th of July 2020. And the Hackett Review made a recommendation to reinstate an enhanced manual to the building regulations and to publish a fully searchable PDF of all approved documents. That's a very useful document, certainly if you're in training, um, to give you a good overview of how the building regulations work. Um, produced by the National Fire Chiefs Council, Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors and Local Authority Building Control, the Building Regulations Fire and Safety Procedural Guidance is uh, available. And this is non-statutory guidance to provide building control bodies, fire and rescue services, and anyone with influence over a building's fire safety arrangements through the REBA stages. Very useful document. I just want to show you or introduce you to some changes to approved document M, which is Access to and Use of Buildings 2015 Volume 2. With 22% of the population disabled, there is still a lot to do to make our buildings more accessible. Changing places toilet provision has risen from 140 um, such facilities in 2002 to 1400, but more are needed now. If you don't already know, a changing places toilet is a large accessible toilet at least 3 metres wide by 4 metres long and 2.4 metres high. And it's for severely disabled people that includes hoists, changing benches and space for carers. And the amendments uh, have come about following a consultation for the provision of changing places, which uh, was carried out in May 2019, and that ran for 10 weeks. It then ended in uh, July 2019, and there was a further consultation for targeted consultation of sectors most likely to be affected. And that ended in February 2020. So the overview is that the provision of changing places toilets within appropriately sized and public accessible buildings in the following new build and change of use building types. Um, so it probably comes as no surprise to you that assembly, recreation and entertainment buildings uh, will be uh, with a capacity for 350 people or more, or a collection of smaller buildings associated with a site used for assembly, recreation or entertainment, such as zoos and theme parks and venues for sport and exhibitions with a capacity of 2,000 people or more. So expect now to see uh, a change in place toilet. Other types of shopping centres or malls or retail parks with gross floor area of over 30,000 meters, 30, metres squared and retail premises with a gross floor area of 2,500 metres squared or more and sport and leisure buildings with gross floor area of over 5,000 metres squared. 
and hospitals and primary care buildings and crematoria and, and um, cemetery buildings. So this slide talks about places of assembly and recreation and entertainment and the definition of those which are in this uh, um, revision to the approved document. The amendments also Sorry, the amendments also state that further guidance on layout and equipment is available from the Changing Places Consortium campaign website. And when we share these slides for you, you'll be able to click on these uh, links and, and have a look at these documents. So the amended approved document will come into force on the 1st of January 2021, uh, except in respect of work already commenced before that date, or in respect of work for which a building notice or initial notice has been given or full plans deposit before that date and provided work commences by the 1st of March 2021. So these are known as transitional provisions. About quarter two now, um, a lot of changes that I've gone through with you, um, and uh, some of it's very complex, um, but the government are absolutely focused on bringing these changes in as quickly as possible. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm just going to now see if I can uh, stop sharing that screen and uh, let's have a look. Get back to the team screen. I'm just going to have a look now at um, see if there are any questions come through. Uh, doesn't look it but if you've got any burning questions at all please um, email me I'd be more than happy to um, look closely at your questions and um, provide responses to those um, I hope you've enjoyed today's session um, I've certainly enjoyed going through the regulations with you and um, we will be um, putting more of these out I think over the coming weeks and months as the regulations change to keep you fully up to date um, I think uh, for me, I, I just want to thank you very much for coming along. I, I do hope to, to see you again soon. And um, if you need any help and support on your uh, applications, please get in touch. We're always happy to help you out. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.